So this panel is about making money with free software. And it's a bit sarcastic because, you know, we make money with or on or through or around. Um, and also, it's not fair to say free software because it sounds like it's free as in a beer. And I talked about this yesterday. It's not about free as in a beer. It's more free as in freedom or liberty and uh, free as in a puppy as in responsibility. So let's keep all of that in mind. Uh, those responsibilities and rights and privileges go all kinds of different directions. Um, this is not about me, this is about the panellists. So what I've asked these four lovely people to do is to introduce themselves and do a bit of a, an overview of their organisation and how their work is supported by free software. So um, perhaps we go by the, the order on the slide there. So starting with Anne. Hang on. Oh. Hang on a sec. Yes? Yeah, <laughs> we can hear you now. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, I'll start again. Hi, I'm Anne. I'm from Coordinates. Um, so our, we are a data management platform and our platform has been built by our team using many open source components over the years um, and they've fed back into those projects as well. So that's how we have grown from open source and we've recently well, about four years ago, we've launched a project called CART, and that is a Git wrapper for geospatial data. So, yeah, we're really into the open source community because we like free and open standards because we want people to be able to use their favourite software, and the way to do that is by using open standards for all of data. So, that's Fantastic. our jam. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Uh, what about you, Amir? Hello everybody, how are you going? My voice is a little bit creaky, I've got massive allergies today. But um, yeah, look, I'm from SOAR. One of, I consider myself a co-founder of SOAR. Got a fantastic team and now we've got an audacious vision to build a new atlas of the world. So this is crowdsourced from everyone, such as yourselves, organisations, companies that have just got maps and they want to get millions of viewers on those maps and we just think that those maps need a place to sit. So we're not about creating maps, we're not about, uh, I guess, editing maps and stuff like that, we're about getting it into the hands of, you know, everyday people, the other 99% that's not in this room. And uh, I just had a call a little bit earlier back home, back to SF, and I was trying to explain to this guy what we do, and I said, look, it's like a YouTube for maps. So that's where we're going through. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's been an incredible journey to get to this point. We were, I guess, incubated with uh, mining industry and defence industry. And to sort of get to this point over here, I think the open source community and the technologies have really been a fulcrum for that. And it's really great to be among peers. Great. Thank you. Niall, you've kind of given the 40-minute version of your two yeah. minutes. <laughs> you don't need to hear more from me. Let's see if you can do it in two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Niall. I'm a Cubist developer and also co-founder of, oh, founder of North Open Solutions. Thank you. Thanks, mate. <laughs> and Renee. Hi, I'm Renee Mansa. very nervous. Uh, first time I've ever been on a stage in front of lots of very knowledgeable people. Hi, everybody. Um, so I work for an Aboriginal corporation um, in the middle of the Pilbara, and we use QGIS to manage and collate a lot of um, Aboriginal heritage site data, manage mining tenements that are coming through so they get flagged so that we know what's happening on country. Um, and, yeah, that's about it in a nutshell, really. Fantastic. All right, so it's now time to ask the audience something so if you can grab your devices and point them at this thing and um, when you're about ready if we can switch over to Slido please legends at the back cool all right so have you or your organization ever contributed time or money to an open source project overwhelming response <laughs> no <laughs> to come in. Don't oh, right. Okay. We'll, we'll give you a bit more time. Maybe, um, maybe we sort of segue this a little bit and say, if there is a newcomer who comes along, what's the most effective way to contribute to QGIS? Is it time or money or something else? Well, probably money is the <laughs> is the most effective way. Um, <laughs> money is. Money is the way to make stuff happen that otherwise wouldn't have happened. And it's, you know, it helps all those boring kind of stuff that just makes a project run, like hosting costs and, you know, infrastructure costs and that. It, it makes it possible. Like, nice. Yeah. 
What about we come backwards along the line? Have you guys pushed in some time or some money De into definitely, the yeah. I mean, projects? North Road team have been fantastic. I mean, I've just been overwhelmed about how good they are, right? Very humble as well. So they're, they're bringing <laughs> we didn't up. set this up. <laughs> yeah, we didn't set this up. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just you know, get under the table later. But, <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is, is that you, you come into a new industry. When I say new industry, from outside, it's normal people, like I said, like the, you know, our analogy of comparing maps to YouTube, right? And then you come in, there's a community there with a technology set. And then you need to make that leap, that fulcrum, as I call it. That is very, very hard to do. Right, because compare. I mean, we're all comparing ourselves to an Esri in some sort of way, right? You've got this behemoth that's sitting there. How hard is it to make code changes in Esri versus Puget's, right? Mm. So I think when people like you know Niall and his team and everyone else that's probably doing similar sort of things in the crowd here, you need those people to be able to do it. So if without, I guess, startups like us or commercial entities like us, that's not possible. So we have to keep pushing that. Mm. And I think a big part of it has to come from the top down as well, such as government organisations, big conglomerates, those kind of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that governments have access to quite a lot of money and then the $5,000 or something it might take to get a bug fixed uh, through an expert organisation is a drop in the ocean, but they still find it hard to justify it. Oh, it's this weird, again, like a false economy. Like, uh, we'll have people contact us and be like, can you fix this bug? It affects us and costs us three hours a week of our staff time, whatever. And like, it'll be, you know, it'll cost this much. Like, oh, no, we can't afford that. <laughs> you just said, you know, it's costing me three hours a week of that staff time. Like, yep. it's, it's weird. Yeah. What about you guys at Coordinate? How much do you input do you have into upstream projects? By upstream, you mean? Oh, like, I don't know, like leaflet open layers or one of the core sort of tools in your. Stack. Stack. Yeah. We recently had North Road, another fail. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's doing well out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we commissioned North Road to build a QGIS plugin for our product. Nice. Um, so that is helping our product get into QGIS, but it's also um, we have many open layers from government who are pushing their data through our product mm. to make it really easy to get to QGIS. Mm. So that's one way that we're supporting. Um, yeah, other upstream products. I couldn't tell you the guts of it because there's so many little pieces. Like we use GDAL yeah. and all these other things under the hood that um, Hamish is probably ticking through his mind because he knows. <laughs> but there's a lot of little parts of various open source projects that all of our team and many of our team are doing their own personal projects as well. Yep. So, yeah, there's a huge amount that goes on underneath that all put together as our IP. Nice. Yeah. I guess, Renee, you're the, at the um, end user side of things. What about... I am, yeah. I was going to say that. Have you raised an issue or a ticket or partic a con I mean, participated in these kind of forums around QG? No, I haven't participated in any of those kind of forums. What I do participate in is GeoGeeks Perth so <laughs> and tend to lean into um, the Brains Trust there to help me out when I've got a bit of an issue. So, yeah, definitely more of an end user experience from my perspective. Yeah. Anybody got any other takes on the, the response here. So we've got 64% saying yes, um, their organisations put time in, 33% yes to money, 24% no, and the 6% don't know. Can we switch the, to the next, to the Q&As? So from here on, audience, I'd love this conversation to be driven by you all. So stick your questions in, put your name on the question. It'd be nice. You don't have to. And... Um, yeah, let's go from there. Any comments? Anything you'd like to raise here? Oh, look, I mean, one of the things I was, you were on a panel yesterday, right? And you said something that other people have probably said before, but it just sometimes someone says something to you and you're like, oh, yeah, just sees him differently. And you said something like, not verbatim, right? So I don't want to quote you on this, but you said, oh, well, if there is a, like, an open source project, right, and you want to make money on top of it, and there's a price point that you've got to pay, is there a way that we could all, for example, let's pretend something's $100 a month, right? And then the, the company charges $80 a month, but that $20 goes towards QGIS community or the QGIS, you know, fixing of the bugs. I just want to know, I mean, my colleagues here and everyone else in the, in the crowd as well, how do you guys feel about that? What's the general consensus? Would you, would you be happy to pay, I call it an open source tax, okay? <laughs> I don't like that word, right? But a levy to continue something. Or are you guys just happy with the big boys in town taking on, or, well, you know, because it is, the big changes are going to be driven by the big boys in town. Or would you be happy to give, a, you know, 
something, someone charges for something and then, you know, maybe there's a small levy or something like that. I mean, Noel, what do you think about that as a as both a producer and a... Uh, I was like, you know, sounds good. <laughs> like, yeah. Because um, uh, you were saying, you know, it, nothing's for free, right? Yeah, well, like, I, I kind of keep coming back to this, this uh, risk management phrase, right? Like, if, if your business depends on open source, it's kind of just like 101, you know, like Common Sense 101, you're trying to run a business in anything and it relies on some piece of software. Like, you want that piece of software to keep working. You know, you don't want it just to be like, all of a sudden it's gone, you know, all of a sudden they've walked away, you've left it, um, and you have to kind of start from scratch again. Like, <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I, I think it's kind of natural. You should want those projects want to be it. sustainable. And mm. Yeah. So that, I think that feeds into um, Staff's question, and thanks for putting your name on that, Staff. Legend. Um, he says he's, he's built QGIS plugins for clients for money. How can you convince them to make it public? And I've got a little analogy, if I may, as well. So I know there's these state governments in Tasmania. I use Open Layers uh, as their framework for their website. And they built a nice thing, and they built some plugins, and they're really proud about using open source and building, building, adding on top of that. And I said, are you going to make those plugins available for free? And they're like, why would I do that? Any comments? Tell me why. What do they say? Just why? They're like shocked that I would suggest that they would make the did you changes, the did improvements. Did you remind them that source. it was taxpayers' dollars? <laughs> 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 I mean, they, it's, it's sort of a similar thing, you know. Like, like we paid for this thing. Why, why would we make this thing that we've got open? Even though they're standing on top, on the shoulders of the whole open community. It's, it's an interesting kind of. Uh, sorry, no, you got. I've got an answer, but. My answer might sound a little bit pessimistic, and I'm kind of worried about that. Um, I was going to say that, actually. You, yeah. You, you take the heat, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so my answer would be, I don't think you need to. Like, uh, sorry, a bit, little, little bit pessimistic, but sometimes it can be a cop-out to make something open source. Like, if you have a tool that is, like, so specifically for use for some particular... Mm need in an organization and there's not really any value for that outside of that organization you know like that tool is yeah. just their business logic and that's it it's only like, going to be one user what's the point yeah you know putting it on github uh, if a project's on github and nobody uses it is it an open source project you know is it any value to the open source ecosystem <laughs> i'm not sure you know uh, maybe one day someone will find a bit of code there or it'll go into a ai training model or something but um I'd say my reservation, my big kind of thing is just make sure that that's not as far as you go. Is like, okay, well, I've, I've made this plugin. I've made some money off it. I've made it open source. Woohoo, done. Have a think about, again, your business is depending on QGIS to make that plugin to make yourself money. Mm. Make sure that QGIS is sustainable in some way. So that's maybe getting that 10% and pushing it upstream and then is it? Yeah, like becoming a you know a sponsor of the project or something like that. Like again, risk management, you want to make sure that Q just keeps going and people keep wanting to use Q just so you can keep making plugins for them and you can keep making money off your clients. Any um, comments from this end of the table? I mean stage? I thought like a great part of contributing to open source is when you're building your business, whatever that is, to keep it in mind, like when I'm building this great new thing, what, how does that impact the wider community? And that's when you can have those positive contributions by adding in. So yeah, like supporting QGIS, because you want users who love QGIS to keep using it. And it's like, as a course of our business, how can we improve and keep supporting those other things? So it's not so much taking open source and building the business from it, but rather as you're doing your thing, you're picking pieces and figuring it all out. And any overflow you have, like Daniel talked last night in Danish um, about the overflow and you've got more to give about how that can actually go back to the community. Yeah. Does anybody remember that word? Yeah. Nah. Old school. Old school. Old school. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Let's go to Ed's question there. Thanks for putting your name in, Ed, legend. Uh, what are your favorite examples of good actors building businesses around open source? Bruce Willis? Thanks, Dad. 
I don't know. I mean, there's so many. I mean, personally for our business, I mean, the Chris is at the back there, but GDAL. I mean, if, I know it's not, it's still open source, but like, look at how many incredible businesses are built around GDAL. I mean, we've talked offline about this, so this yeah. is incredible. And it's not, I guess, a business, but it's an example of, I guess, a series of steps that can be built around it. I just wanted to also on that and that question is, think, deconstruct what open source or G, um, QGIS is going to be in 10 years, right? Just, just look 10 years in the future and see what the community is going to be, what the technology stack is going to be. We're going through a massive change right now with AI coming on board. I've spoken to a few people about it, and I mean, I spoke to Ed about it yesterday at the dinner yesterday, what Meta are doing with AI. It just blew me away. And you know, this morning I've been reading up on it, and let's just deconstruct what that way is going to, how is that going to change the way we work? Is that going to disrupt us? Is that going to enable us? And I think that those favourite examples are going to get bigger and bigger, but I think they're going to be different. We're going to be, I, I think it's going to be a, an incredible next 10 years for geospatial as a whole. Mm. And I really think that open source is going to be that next step. I mean, I'd love to see what my colleagues think about that. And even AI, because really the AI term mm. doesn't come up as much as what it probably should. Yeah, I mean, if I can put a kind of different spin on that question, um, like a, a specific example, I would say, of a company that is built around open source and is contributing really well back to open source would be like Crunchy Data. You know, they're doing a lot with PostGIS and yep. and the libraries that kind of PostGIS depend on, um, and then the benefits of that just flowing out to every single person in this room yep. as, a, as a result. Like. While we're there, what about the Elasticsearch thing where they write, Anybody can use this for free except for AWS. <laughs> I don't have a question for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let's not go there. Hey, I've got one. I've got one of my my questions for here for for Renee. Um, do you have any experience or challenges working with clients that might be skeptical of open source? Like, do you have people within your organisation or nearby who are like, but why? Always, excuse me, always, yes. Um, we've had, uh, I've come across a couple of people, uh, generally mining companies. They love to bandy about all the Esri anythings. Um, but yeah, the functions that they have, just they don't mean anything to me or my day-to-day -day workflows. Um, I've had some pushback from new people who have never used QGIS. Um, I'd like to also stipulate at this point that I'm the only person that does GIS in my organisation. Um, and I'm trying to teach other people. So I'm finding that anything that has a paywall is just not worth it. Um, I want to get people using the, the products. I want to get people learning about uh, GIS. So yeah, I much prefer QGIS and I will push back as hard as I can all the time. Can I um, pivot a bit too and call out staff here? Because you go into remote communities and teach, right? Sure. Could you do that with, if there was a license fee attached to that? Can we give them a mic? I suppose that's really the basis of my interest in open source is to that it democratises access to tools. Mm. And I um, always look for accessible tools so no matter who I work with, I'll have access to it. That's kind of why I, why I became interested in it. And a good example, I think, is why I became interested in Terrier, for example, because it kind of democratises access to digital twin tech because I was um, working on a project where there were digital twins, but the software to present them was owned by the company, so they had control over the data, and therefore the presentation of, of truth, in a way. So does that, does yeah. that kind of an answer the question a bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any um, yeah, I guess data sovereignty is a big, huge thing, too, um, in Aboriginal organisations. We're talking about sensitive cultural information, and it shouldn't be in the wrong hands, so to speak. Um, once it's outside the organisation, you lose control of what um, anything meaningful with that data. So <clears throat> we want to try and keep it in-house. Um, yeah, that's another really important consideration to think about as well. I know there's some talk around some other organisations well, um, around Australia, and they're like, how do we get more Aboriginal data out to the open sphere? And I'm like, don't. <laughs> Just don't. And don't take my word for it. You have to have a chat to everybody about it as well. But that's the general consensus as well. So open source makes sense. It gives um, control to people who don't have access to big funds to be able to manage their own data. I just I want to ask a contrarian question on that, Renee. What if Esri turns around and says to you guys, 
and every single Aboriginal organisation in Australia for life. You've got Arcgis, Esri, whatever you want, whatever, for free, forever, as many, thousands of licences. <laughs> you would, no. would probably take it, right? No, well, well, I wouldn't take yeah. it. It's a proprietary company. Their mission okay. is to make money. So but you're no, getting it for free. Already, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just looking at it from a contrarian strategy, right? So I am really stubborn. The answer's no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell, I'll, I'll, yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. But, like, I mean, I, I look at it in my point of view, right? And I talk to PE funds. I talk to public funds. I talk to VCs, right? These people are capitalists, right? Okay? And that way you're thinking is great that she's, you know, so, so stubborn, right? We need more of that, right, to be able to hold it out, right? But There's a little bit more nuance. Yeah, sure, sure. No, no, it's good. But, like, there are people out there that could be, well, inverted commas, bought, you know, for free. And I, I don't know where that is. I mean, I was talking to, okay, I'll drop the name, Saudi Aramco, right? Saudi Aramco is Esri end to end. Inside Saudi Aramco, they've got QGIS coming out, individual users of QGIS, right? You would not believe how much Esri gives them for free, for whatever they spend. Mm -hmm. that, that, so, you know, you, but they've been sucked in by this massive... But that's, that's where the conversation around free is not just free as in beer. Exactly. The other rights that you have, that you're preserving for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I don't know what, from a coordinates point of view, how would you feel about that? Because you've got a lot of data coming in from um, governments, right? So, I mean, do you guys use any Esri products to push, push your product? Only testing. Only testing? Yeah. Okay. So, we service everybody. We just have open standards um, through our site so that anyone can use it. Um, and we have one Esri licence so that we can test. But, yeah, I think they very much see us as competition because we're a platform for data. Yep. Yeah. And that comes around full circle, right? It's not, free is not anti-making money. I'm actually allowed to get QGIS and package it up and call it Alex GIS and sell it for money. Maybe I'd burn some bridges, <laughs> but well, I can. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's people that do. Like, yeah. Name names? Um, who, who, who does that? Oh, just, yeah. Like I said, it's not it's not against the terms of service or anything. Like it's not against the, the license. Sorry, you can get Q just you can fork it, you can rebrand it, you can add in thousands of features and sell it to someone and be like yep. Q just Pro or whatever. Um, you can do that. Actually, it's a trademark, but you could call it something else. Super GIS Pro. Or whatever. Um, that's trademark. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to just buy the domain name while you were there. Yeah. All right, let's jump to one of these questions. Um, so, Leo, thank you for putting your name up. Uh, what's the best way for a company to offer to sponsor an open source project to add some feature? Uh, send emails to the most active contributors, or is there a better way? This is the QGIS love, and I guess, Niall, you better answer this. How do I donate money to QGIS? I mean, I've got a biased answer to that one. So, if, you, if you're talking about, like, a specific feature, for QGIS, it's a little bit different for some other projects, so it's not, this is not a global answer, but QGIS as a project uh, explicitly says we don't do that. So if you give money to QGIS, it's not for features, it's not for uh, specific work contracts and that. And they it's collect for that money and they prioritise their own money, right? They take that money and they use it to make the project sustainable. So it's not about adding new features into it. Um, other projects will have a different stance on that, um, but Generally, that's pretty common, you know, like the, the money given to the project is just about keeping the project running. And then they would say, if you want a, a feature added, here's a list of organisations you can contact who do this. Um, good luck, you know, bye. That's our kind of thing done. Um, so in answer to that question, I would probably say, uh, you know, have a look. Have a look and see who is contributing actively to that project, who you think are good guys, who you think are possibly leeches, just kind of taking from the project um, and who are doing good work, you know, like if you can kind of see stuff they've done in the past and you're like, yeah, that works really well, you know, that I've seen that they've done that and I use it and it doesn't crash, then that's probably a good way to um, decide who to send that email to to ask. Any comments from others? Best way to sponsor an open source project? I'd say just get amongst. Get amongst it, go on yeah. to Filing bugs, like if you, something breaks yeah. in QGIS, writing it up carefully with detail, awesome. helpful. Yeah, even if you're using it and you can't contribute because your expertise isn't quite there like myself, um, to just give feedback and say, I love your 
thing that you've created, it's so useful, I use it all the time. Just for people to even know that you're using it really helps because then you know, oh, well, we'll we can put more time in here for ourselves or, yeah, so I think just feedback of some sort, if not contribution. I, I don't think that can go understated either. Like, I, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying this, like there's heaps of people in the room who contribute to open source and that. And, like, there is a part of doing business with open source where you have to get a thick skin because you'll get emails from people who are like, how dare you charge for this? You know, you should be giving away everything you do for free and whatever, and you, you've learned to turn that away. But on the flip side, every now and then you get an email just out of the blue from someone who's like, hey, I really like what you do. And those emails, like, you know, they make your morning when you get them. You're like, <laughs> And you like, know, it's the validation to keep going. It's like, is nobody using this? And then you find out 100 people are, and you're like, oh, we're on to something. It helps with that market validation to go, yep, we're on something, we'll keep doing it. It's really, really helpful. Any other comments? Let's jump to another question. How can governments support open source projects? Should they pay money to the project if they want something or contribute in a more systematic way, providing developer time. What about, is there someone from Lins? What does Lins do? Daniel? Over here? Hands up. Hi. Uh, yeah, we've supported with both money and, and time. Uh, so we wanted some um, changes to the stack standard after that was released and turned out some of them were not entirely possible but yeah there's um, it was actually very easy to get get it going uh, we got buy-in very quickly and uh, yeah the process was fairly simple I didn't do it myself but um, yeah uh, I think you'd have to talk to Jeremy yep yeah about that yeah what about on the panel have you got experience dealing with governments working at Landgate in WA for a while. Um, it's not in a particularly meaningful way, it's just a adequate you know, ambassador. Um, but for me and my workflow, more data, just have more data available so that yeah. it does sort of have a more standard system yep. across the board. Open data is super handy if you're not in government. Absolutely. That's why I'm in my job. I worked <laughs> for government in various other places for 10 years and I felt, you know, I studied GIS at university. I, thought this is amazing, yeah. I'm going to do all this modeling, I'm going to have such a good time. And I started and there just wasn't the data to do it. And then 10 years later, there wasn't a lot more. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I'm in the business now of getting... So now you fixed it. Well, we're working, yeah. <laughs> There's a, the landscape has completely changed, it's a lot better, but we've still got quite a ways to go with yeah. um, the avail availability of taxpayer funded data into people's hands easily as we're not there yet, I don't think. I just wanted to say, um, maybe if you can scroll back up, someone wrote a uh, question about education. I don't know who it was, but maybe that lends into sort of academia getting behind it as well. Like, it's been a while since I was in uni, but I mean, how many QGIS courses are there at university? I don't know. Is there lots? No. I don't believe there's any. Sorry? So that's the... TAFE NSW, is that, or the, the across a few TAFE? TAFE. Yeah, there's a lot of them, but they're not all in the same place, so okay. it's not really defined. Yep. There's a few that are in the same place, but there's not like a particular one that you need to be in. So it's not like you're going to the same place every year and you're going to be in the same place. It's like you're going to the same place every year and you're going to be in the same place, but you're not going to be in the same place every year. Yep. I think that's really important though, right? Because you look at ER Mapper, I don't know who here can remember ER Mapper, right? I love ER Mapper, <laughs> still do. But the thing is with that company was, I remember when I was in university doing my honours and then went to PhD, that software was pretty much free. So I was immersed into it and everything that I did when I came out, I was instantly, I mean there was Erdas around which ended up acquiring ER Mapper and Envy and all these other things, but instantly I was sucked into that vacuum of ER Mapper. And you look at parallels to our industry, like the design 
world, like Adobe and mm. Canva. We all yep. know Canva, right? You go to, a, I mean, university. I went. They they all use Canva. They, they you know they always say you know the students oh we've got a Canva course or something. So I mean, they don't if they don't what give those courses. Can I hear from the younger folks in the audience? Yeah. Someone who's been at, over here at the back. Can you get a mic? Um, I know that people teach Blender, which is a horrendous idea <laughs> at university. I um, think it's the same thing as Dawn at the University of Newcastle. We teach both uh, QGIS and R, and that's both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. And also at USP, at the University of the South Pacific, we, uh, I was part of a team that actually developed course materials for a postgraduate diploma, um, and we actually included QGIS. <laughs> so wow, well students will be <laughs> and before we move on, I just want to add that perhaps even when it's going down a step further, that the lower the end of the ladder, just explaining to people about QGIS mm. is a really good start. Um, yep. There's a lot of people in my organisation who have no idea what Maps is, um, let alone QGIS, and to be able to show them on my computer in Google Docs, it's pretty quite loaded. Um, and then, yeah, just having a play, like it's, it's free. So just download it on your computer and have a go. Just start playing around. Mm. Get, get somebody to show you how to connect to some raw spatial spatial data and just move some lines around. Learn what a polygon is. Um, I think it's that's really important too. And it's really like a plant the seed for yep. people to learn more about the region because it's not natural. It's a big part of it. Is there another comment from someone over there? All right, I'm going to pivot into uh, um, Nick's fantastic question, and thank you for putting your name on there, Nick. What a legend. Um, how can we encourage companies behind open source software to use open licenses like MIT instead of a GPL or CopyLeft or Mapbox GL style commercial licenses? Or are these licenses necessary? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out um, Amir here. Oh. So are you terrified of GPL? No, not at all. But I mean, these are companies. That's what you've got to think about it, right? And I really, look, I'm not educated in the technical side of things to make a comment on this, but I can tell you from a corporate slash startup side of things, these decisions are going to matter big time. Mm. So that we need to be very, very thoughtful from an open source community to, about these things. And I think that, look, the whole Mapbox experience, I don't know how they're going internally, but you've got other companies out there that are might be able to fit into that space. I don't know. Yep. But that's just an yep. overall comment. And is people aware of the distinction between a, a GPL or a BSD license? Like, one is viral copyleft, and it means that you must open your product if you include it. And the other, um, GDAL, for example, is um, BS, um, BSD, isn't it? MIT? MIT, I think. MIT, which means you can bundle it with commercial software and keep that closed. And so that's why <laughs> GDAL's <laughs> proprietary software. That, that's why it can be used in FME and ArcMap and MapInfo and all of these products. And so I, th I guess that's the background to Nick's question. Is can, I, can I chuck something in there? So yeah. if the question is like, how can you encourage those companies to use a different license instead of the AGPL or that? Like, I'd say have a look at why they're choosing those licenses. You know, they're choosing that because they need to make money, right? So they're protecting their revenue stream because they don't want somebody else coming in, taking their work and you know, cutting them off and making the money instead. Because there's been countless examples of that happening, right? So if you want to encourage them not to make that choice, you have to make it so they can sustain themselves without making that choice. And you know, that would be help them make money using those other licenses, you know, make it so they they're it's worth their time to spend that, the development cost and the R&D and all that making their software under those alternative licenses. It's really the only answer that I can see. All right, I think it's time to start wrapping up. Um, maybe we'll just do this last, this um, top question from Anonymous. And shame on you for not attaching it. No, I don't need to do that. <laughs> As a professional specializing in FOS4G, how best to demonstrate competency in the market? Is there certifications or something else? How do you know someone's uh, That's a fantastic question. got the qualification? That's the whole follow-on for the whole education thing. I mean, you guys work for the government. How would you see it if you guys were hiring someone? Would you I'm the only GIS rep on my project, so I'm already like the best. You're <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, true. <laughs> <laughs> I get a free pass. <laughs> yeah. Just need to show them what I do for my 
that that's why that's why we're here by the clock. The remaining <laughs> four plus two. <laughs> but I mean, there is no c certification, is there? There's no universal. I mean, is, can the panel decide in the future on what is the minimum level of expertise? No. Nah, well, so my answer to that one would be, um, uh, like, just put your stuff out there. You know, like the again, pretty pretty uh, coarse example, but like write blog posts and that, write about what you do, you know, write about the exciting stuff and just kind of self-promote and self-promote and self-promote. And, and that really, like, if I, was, if I was hiring somebody and I wanted to pick someone who was awesome and open source and, um, and competent, then I'd already have names in my head because I'd be like, I know that person, you know, they, they wrote that awesome article about doing something cool, you know, writing that map, making that map or something like that. Um, I, I reckon that's kind of the best way yeah, for us, we hire developers rather than geospatial analysts, and we look at their GitHub presence, which is like promoting yourself, so you can see someone's track record, you can see the way that they're contributing to other projects and what their work has been, so you get quite a lot of visibility of what someone's competency is. Um, and we've just released CART, which is a wrapper around Git, as I mentioned, so I imagine in the future you'll be able to have a lot more track records of people's editing and version control on their on data sets they may have worked on. So I think, you know, in the world that we're going into, there'll be a lot more traceability of our online footprint and there will be a lot more visibility. So, yeah, I don't have an answer for right now, but just seeing what we have in the coding world, um, one day that might translate to data into geospatial as well. Mm. Great tip. I'm going to tell my students to come back and work for a developer. Oh, yeah, sometime. get on, get <laughs> Yep. Do some projects. Yep. Yeah, it's just so transparent to see how active someone is. Yeah. I, I have a, an addition to that. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Uh, I think certification, if it's about implementing the software and using it as a tool, it would be really good to have a certification. If it's about merit in a project, certification is not so much a thing. <laughs> And there's no certification currently for most of the tools that we have in the Tostrategy community uh, to be certified as a professional delivering services. That would be really good. I, I should point out there actually is like a, a certification program for QGIS trainers. So there is a formal thing that has been set up where a person can prove their worth to become a trainer for QGIS and then they're allowed to give out officially endorsed certificates at the end of their courses to say, you know, you've, you've passed this QGIS training. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a, an exception, you know, someone spent a lot of time setting up that program yep. for QGIS and keeps it running and that. It, it's not like a cross, cross the board, cross project thing. Um, uh, I'd love to see it rolled out, you know, wider and, and have those kind of same programs for other, for other things. All right, I think we want to do a bit of wrapping up, so maybe um, it's up from your end. Um, summary, summary, wrapping up, final thoughts? Niall? Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, I've, I've had lots of thoughts. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, what about you, Amir? Yeah, I just want to go back on the deconstruction of what things are going to be like in 10 years. I think we're in that slipstream now, everyone knows what a map is, right? And if people can build on it, there's gonna be some incredible stuff going on in the next 10 years. Just, and once again, like, you know, we, don't, we haven't talked about it really here, but I've, I've said the word AI, and what does it mean to everybody? It's gonna, it's gonna change, I think, open source. And, you know, like the reading that I did this morning on what Meta's working on in an open source environment as well for AI, I think it's gonna profoundly change people's experiences within the next 10 years in what is open source. And I, it's probably early in the piece, but I guess my summary of takeaway of, of this is, is that there's just so many people waiting to come into the pool. They're just dipping their toes in, they're dipping their toes in, but what's happening is there's other pools popping up everywhere. <laughs> they're trying to choose which pool to go in. Now, do you, if you want to be a geospatial professional, are you going to go into this pool, which is QGIS and open source, or are you going to come in via Unity and Blender and all these gaming apps? Because, you know, I saw there was a cool presentation yesterday about gaming, you know, and, and you know, fictional maps and stuff like that, right? So I think, yeah, and that's why I was 
really interested to see what happens from an educational point of view and what people are teaching at universities such as this. Thanks. Um, I think open source gives us a chance to participate as a community because out in the business world we have to make money to pay salaries and do all those things. So your priorities are going to be a lot more insular and for your business. Whereas open source allows us to look after the community as a whole. So it's really important to keep collaborating, feedback, and keeping those networks going. Yeah. Yeah, I love that community. Yeah. Renee? Yeah, um, I agree with Alex's comments. I think it's a good use of money, um, but also from the bottom up approach, like the more that we can do and how well we can get the values of um, open source and open source values together in the blood of such a universe is quite important. Great. Well, um, I've got a closing thought, uh, a mission for you all. So if you can all, when you go home, send an email to the developer of your favourite open source software project and just say thank you. <laughs> That'd be really great. Emailing and please join me in thanking uh, the panel here.